and welcome to Motor Week from the 1999 Detroit Auto Show. Now, in a world that's packed with every conceivable class of car, BMW have decided to launch a totally new type of vehicle here at the show. This is the BMW X5, and you'll find it listed under a new category, SAV, Sports Activity Vehicle. We have leather here all everywhere. We have inside leather. You can change the color. You can combine the colors. Okay. You're free outside inside this is very interesting for many people and then we have this special wood trims the, 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 how it fits together is a is a chance you have with the cars in the back wow in the back there is hot water for coffee or tea <laughs> and we have a picnic very exclusive one the same color trim those are little things you have to combine you have to think about and then fit together and you have a car that looks different this blend of luxury executive saloon and off-road vehicle comes packed with the kinds of refinement, quality and performance that you expect and you always get in a BMW. And I suppose it should come as no surprise that this rather unusual BM was designed by Chris Bangle, the creator of the Z3 and the M Coupe. Well, this is a kind of a new thing for, for us. It's really a new thing in itself. People were used to SUVs, you know, sport utility vehicles. But uh, we asked ourselves, do people really drive these things? They really like it. And it turns out that although many people appreciate the extra space, in fact, you sit up a little bit higher, you know, kind of look where you're going on the road a little bit easier, they didn't like the fact that they drive like trucks. So BMW being BMW what it is, they asked you know, the question, oh, how do you make one of these things really drive like a BMW? So the whole idea behind the sport activity vehicle is the activity is you know, yours. You know, you're an active person. You want to drive. You want to be into a car that drives like it should, but still have a little bit more lifestyle elements like more luggage space and getting in and out with more, more ease, that kind of stuff. So that's what we call it this. Best we can do as a name, I guess. Just you to think of something new. Now you have um, designed some of the most enjoyable cars I can think of, the Z3, the M Coupe, they are just great cars. Is the X5 a car to have fun in? Is it going to be an enjoyable car as well? well it's definitely a car to have fun. This car drives so cool. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Now, um, we have a really talented design team that's very international, and they put all their talents into this, like all the other cars, and I think this one really shows it really is kind of the best of the breed. Okay, you've managed, it's a crossover vehicle, but I know you probably won't like me calling it that, but it is a blend of executive saloon bike with 4x4. How have you managed to do that? How have you managed to make it this car that people can go off-road in, but can also, you know, go down the motorway on a very long journey in? How have you, how have you combined that? Um, there's some of the physical aspects of the car. It has the best aerodynamics in its class mm -hmm. by a long shot. So that means you can drive it really well. It has this long wheelbase. Yeah. It rides well on the road. But it sits up high, which means, you know, you got snow and stuff like that on the road. You can go over it without a problem. The really rugged areas on the car down a little bit lower. Muscles and the flanks. You know, this is new for us. You know, usually we have these very tight wheel lips. This is a bit more <laughs> bullig is the word in German. Um, we put protection areas on it down in the rockers, around the tailpipe, around the front lights, like chin guards on a, on a, on a hockey mask, yeah. right? Because that's where the, the, the rugged action is happening but the, the passengers for instance they're framed in a very nice elegant greenhouse real speedy real sleek the whole upper has this sense of, of moving dynamic like this part just travels smooth and the lower part is doing all <laughs> the real hard stuff sounds like an exciting ride to yeah, me yeah it's fun inside uh, it really is it, you could be in an executive 5 series you, you sort of you, you're cushioned and cosseted in there as well and BMWs are not cars that you normally go and get really dirty in are they is this a car you can go out and get dirty in and go off-roading. Can you really do all those things in it? Um, well, you know, the real goal for off-roading is another part of our company. That's why we have Land Rover. Land Rover is the ones where you're, you know, you're going to take on planet Earth. Yeah. That's what you're doing. I mean, that's a classic, yeah. right? You know, yeah. camel trophy type stuff. This is really a car for any road, any time, any reason, which I like. I like that idea. An all-reason car. Yeah. So it really is designed to be on the road. Now, uh, that's another aspect about the sport utility vehicle phenomenon is that 95% of the time nobody drove these things off-road. Sure. So for those people who are really dedicated, we have Land Rovers and, right. and they're great. But it's these people are more like cars. Now, you asked about getting dirty yeah. and things like that. Okay, all BMWs, you wash them and get them dirty. Okay, <laughs> that happens like any time. But maybe this car, the whole environment of about it is one that um, you don't mind being in a larger car. You don't mind sitting up commanding over the road yeah. from there. And of course, we, we try and take care that you know we have rockers and things like that so the dirt doesn't come into where you are. 
That was one thing that I was, I was going to ask you, was obviously Land Rover have got this huge heritage, and is there some kind of, do you talk to Land Rover, are you sort of letting them know what you're doing, and you know, obviously Land Rover are very important and you don't want to tread on their toes and they make great off-road vehicles, and did you really have that in mind all the time when you were designing this car? Oh sure, do oh you, sure. Do the two design departments talk about how each other's, you know, how the developments of each other's products are going? Oh that's really key, yeah, and Jeff Mupex runs a great design team there up at Rover with the Land Rover guys too, and, and oh we're always in contact but not the kind where we want to mix and become one thing. Sure. It's much more the kind, let's be careful that we carve out the, the different territories. So for instance, the sense of overly rugged, is overly truckiness, that of course we leave to the Land Rover guys. A certain sense of on-road, just super capability. This car was developed on the Nürburgring racetrack and everybody knows that you're gonna do racing, you do it there. Uh, that's more the, the BMW approach. So the design departments talk, of course, to make sure we don't wind up in each other's soup. So this is a car that we could take on a racetrack if we wanted to do. I have. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> when it goes on sale in the UK next summer, the X5 will feature the eight-cylinder engine from the 5 and the 7, BMW's super smooth straight 6, and also the new direct injection diesel engine, the most powerful engine of its kind. Now, here's a car in Detroit that's of interest to us back in the UK. This is the new Lincoln LS. Now, Lincoln is not a name that we're familiar with back at home, but here it's the luxury division of Ford, and these sort of cars sit alongside the likes of the Cadillac, large luxury saloons that just waft along the highway. Well, this is the small baby Lincoln, and it will be introduced to the UK maybe later this year, more likely in the year 2000. And it will sit alongside the Ford brands, maybe replacing the Scorpio to a certain extent, but it's not gonna carry the Ford badge. But that could be Ford's problem. Where does the new Lincoln LS sit in their range? Do they create separate dealerships, as Vauxhall have done with Cadillac? The all-new Lincoln LS is on an all-new platform designed with the technical features of other successful cars in the global arena. Rear-wheel drive, four-wheel independent suspension, a choice of four-valve overhead camshaft engines and two new transmissions, all-speed traction and your control, and anti-lock brakes. Plus, of course, all the usual gimmicks like airbags, climate control, all standard features. Plus, a first surely for here in the States, the LS V6 can be ordered with a five-speed close ratio manual transmission, which is amazing for America, a manual gearbox, the first in the Lincoln since 1951. Now inside the LS, it's quite a smart design. It has a sort of European style to it, not the conventional American interior that we normally see in large luxury cars. And maybe that's because that this car is going to be sold worldwide, not just here in America. It's going to be sold in Britain, as I've already mentioned, the whole of Europe and Asia too. Ford's president, Jack Nasser, says he wants this car to compete with the best in the world, the luxury sports sedan market, and it needs to be good, that's for sure. Now, price-wise, it's anybody's guess what it could be. The Scorpio, when it finished, was topping out around about £30,000, so this could be around that sort of feel without interfering too much into Jaguar S-type territory. Under the bonnet, you get a choice of two engines here in the States, a 3.0-litre V6 and a 3.9-litre V8. Chances are we'd only see the 3.0-litre V6 in the UK. Well, it may not look that different, but this is the all-new Jeep Grand Cherokee. The vehicle that really started off the big butch 4x4 craze over here has been revamped and is on sale in the spring. Now, it may look very similar to the old model, but the chaps at Chrysler tell me the only bit that's actually the same is the rear view mirror. If you thought the new Grand Cherokee looked pretty big, then take a look at this. It's the Jeep Commander, and nobody's going to argue with a name like that. And while you're feeling fully in command on the road, you'll actually be treading rather lightly where the environment is concerned. Following the theme of alternative fuels with Daimler Chrysler's concepts this year, the Commander features fuel cell technology. The basic idea of a fuel cell is an old idea. An English inventor 159 years ago uh, surmised that if, if you could use electricity to uh, um, uh, applied to water to generate hydrogen and oxygen, why not do it backwards uh, and, and uh, put hydrogen and oxygen together and generate water and electricity? 
And that's basically what a fuel cell does. And, and today, uh, they're used in the space shuttle and in the space station, and they, they cost several million dollars each. Uh, so there's obviously a limited market, but there's a great deal of interest in trying to reduce the cost of a fuel cell um, down to the point where you could put it into a vehicle and use it as a very clean power source, making nothing but water. The big challenge, of course, with doing that, apart from the cost of a fuel cell, is that hydrogen is hard to find. Uh, and there are some concerns just with simply making available hydrogen um, because it is obviously a, a flammable substance. Um, what we tried to do, uh, two years ago we, we broached the idea of reforming gasoline into hydrogen um, on board the vehicle. And we said two years ago that we would be back in two years with, with, with how we'd done. And so the commander demonstrates basically a progress report on how we're doing. Even when using technology like that, you'd think that the weight of a vehicle that stands 69 and a half inches tall and is a massive 80 inches wide would be a problem. But no, to compensate, Chrysler have used the same injection molded plastic that's featured in many of their previous concepts. What it does is reduces manufacturers' costs, it saves 50% of the body weight and is almost 100% recyclable. Who said you can't have brains with brawn as well? We deliberately went for that wide look, that very wide stance, because we see Jeeps as being very solid, off-road, couldn't, you know, couldn't um, uh, turn a vehicle over, it's got to be solid, uh, well positioned, and the wheels are always at the outside of the body. But the other thing was we had to package a, what we call a chemical plant in there in order to propel it, and that did, that did tend to drive the width that we have there. But either way, it's a nice, comfortable package, uh, plenty of room, three across seating in the rear. Um, probably a little, a little wide for the European uh, market, but uh, over here it looks perfectly right in scale. General Motors is the world's number one car maker. It's got a staggering 77 models in its lineup. But recently it's had problems. Critics have panned its cars for being too dull, too boring. They say, compared to Ford, it's looking a bit frumpy. Well, GM have come to this show with all guns blazing. They've brought out no fewer than five concept cars from their different brands, which they say proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that boring is the last thing they are. They're bold, they're adventurous, and some of them are downright outrageous. Now this, even by American standards, is seriously wacky. It's a case of is it an estate? Is it a 4x4? Four four? Is it a sports coupe? The answer is, it's the Chevrolet Nomad, and Chevrolet say that it's a crossover. For me, it looks like a DIY hot rod that somebody's put together in the back of their garage. But it does look absolutely sensational. No one will ignore you if you're driving down the street in this machine. Chevy say that the Nomad is the estate car for the family man who likes to seriously motor. It's got all the versatility you'd expect for an estate, but with a 5.7 V8 engine, it goes like the clappers. This is serious fun for the family man who wants to be a lot different. The Nomad has another little priceless gem. It's got an amazing 36-inch opening concertina roof that just pushes back like 50s style to the front of the car, turning it into an open top sports car. Now that's what I call serious versatility for the family man. Chevy say that the Nomad is the estate car for the family man who likes serious fast motoring. A car that will handle like a coupe, but that's got all the versatility inside of the typical family estate. The seats inside all fold down so it's practical as well as looking absolutely outrageous. It's got a 5.7 litre V8 engine that will provide enough performance of a small supercar. For my mind, this is a classic example of a car that even makes the Chevy Corvette, one of the great names in motoring, look a bit staid and sensible. After the break, more exclusive coverage from the Detroit Auto Show. Why USA's Jaguars have a flying mascot, how the VW Beetle has been beefed up, and we ride the Hyundai Santa Fe.
Now here's an interesting thing that we found out here in the States on Jaguar cars. It's the famous flying logo, flying mascot that we know and love and we see so very rarely on cars back in the UK. Why is that? Because it's banned in the UK and Europe. It's deemed a safety hazard. If you're going to get hit by a car, you're going to get hit by a car. Surely that's not going to make very much difference. But amazingly out here in the States, where there are more and more safety laws in prevalence, here you actually get it as standard. It's a little thing, but it adds a bit of je ne sais quoi. And finally, one piece of Jaguar trivia. Did you know that the famous flying musket was actually never liked by Jaguar founder William Lyons. He would never have it on cars whilst he was in charge until BL took Jaguar over in the mid-70s and it became standard until European safety laws came in and they ditched it again. Bit of useless information from Detroit. Now, if you've ever thought that the new Beetle wasn't quite beefy enough, then I've got some great news for you. There's a stylist in Wolfsburg who thinks along the same lines, so he decided to feed it a few steroids. It's really uh, the basic desire to put a bit of um, blood into the car, and as the Americans say, uh, give the car legs. Because uh, the, the present Beetle at the moment is a lovely car, um, but it's, it's really got a sort of shopping car image um, and it's not the type of car which would really inspire somebody to, you know, uh, have fun driving. And that get sort of out thing. there and, and Get out there it. and really go for it and really, and, you know, enjoy the art of driving as it were. And this is what we want to instill in the car. Well, so you give them quite a free hand with this because it's very crazy what you've created. It's quite over the top. Yeah. We, you, you're obviously given quite a lot of free reign just to let your imagination run wild. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, basically, it was it was uh, right from the beginning. It wasn't really a proper project, and uh, and that's why it's uh, we had the freedom because um, at the beginning it was a kind of a sideline project and said, well, you know, what if and uh, suddenly it took off and uh, our big boss said yeah let's go for it and uh, here we are. It must be exciting to work for a company that lets you be so free with your ideas and there aren't many around that do that. Mm. Oh yeah definitely. Um, uh, I mean obviously it depends from project to project but uh, yeah we do get the occasion to do that and it's great fun to do it and this is when we say you know it's great to be a car designer. Well, the exterior styling that you're responsible for certainly makes you know, an impact. People can't get their hands off it, they're all over it. What about under the bonnet? Is there going to be some real meat under there as well to oh, back it all up? Definitely. I mean, the car or the concept wouldn't really have any validity if it didn't have the power to go with it. And um, they're talking about, if you look under the engine, it's got a VR6, and they're talking about either the VR6 or the VR6 by turbo between 200 and uh, 350 horsepower. Very meaty, lovely. Yeah. So what are the chances of this becoming a production reality? What do you think? I think very good actually because uh, although we didn't really, we paid scant attention to the production ability of it because uh, that way we'd be able to get the freedom to do what we wanted. Uh, at the end of the day we found that there was very little to stop us actually putting it into production and um, uh, our big boss Pete said, you know, could well be a good possibility. Which, uh, wow. Well, uh, I, I think the reaction here has said it all really. It looks amazing. It'd be great to see them on the roads. Thanks for talking to us. No Beefy Beetle's real name is actually the RSI Beetle. Could stand for Ria Shirazi, the guy who styled this wonderful thing. But more likely, repetitive strain injury. Because that's what you're going to get constantly dialing Volkswagen, finding out when it's going to go on sale. All aboard, folks, for the Santa Fe Express. This is Korean car giant Hyundai taking its first step of hitting the trail on the 4x4 market. And as you can see from the look of it, they've made a pretty good job of it. Hyundai have shown with the Hyundai Coupe that when it comes to design, they're beginning to be a match for anybody. And this is another very good example of them hitting it on the nail first time. The Santa Fe will go on sale in the UK in the spring of the year 2000. Don't expect it to be called Santa Fe. They say they'll be getting another name. Pity, really, I quite like the old Wild West sound. Uh, with the value for money emphasis Hyundai always have, expect it to be very competitively priced, around 16,000, which will make it more than competitive against the likes of Freelander, Honda CRV. Yeah, we may not be market leaders in terms of technology, or we may not be uh, cutting through new areas of science, but what we are doing is giving them sophisticated products at very, very good value prices. 
The Santa Fe again shows with the design that you are learning very quickly when it comes to producing models that are not only good in Korea but Europe and as this shows in America. Can we expect uh, some more designs and breakthroughs into other areas of the market shortly? Oh, absolutely, Ken. I mean, I think as uh, the Hyundai Coupe showed everybody over the last two years, um, we, we may be coming later to some of these market sectors, but we can certainly do a damn good job when we get there. Uh, what we're doing with this is, is coming into a, a sector that, that is very individual and is now becoming very demanding. Um, equally, during the next 12 months, you will see uh, an, an MPV from Hyundai. Uh, and that, again, will, will have learned from the mistakes of the past It'll give people good flexibility, it'll give them good space, good economy, at a good price. And, you know, we, we, we've got other models in the pipeline. There are crossover models, hybrid models. The plan is that there will be at least 10 vehicles in the Hyundai range before 2005. And does this confirm Hyundai's fierce determination to become one of the world's top 10 players? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, in spite of all that's happened in Korea and in Asia over the last 12 to uh, 15 months with the uh, economic crisis, um, what you've seen is that Hyundai have committed to a development program, a research and development program, a technical program, second to none in that sector. Um, we're not diverting funds away from the important areas of developing good quality new products. The Santa Fe was actually designed by Hyundai's Californian studio and it shows. It looks very at home in amongst the rest of the 4x4s here at the Detroit show. Next week on Motor Week, more exclusive coverage from the 1999 Detroit Auto Show, including Nissan's possible Toronto replacement, the rugged X-Terra, also the bizarre Mitsubishi concept from the world of Mad Max, and more on Cadillac's night vision technology. We'll see you next week, but if you missed last week's Motor Week, let's take a look at more of the highlights from Detroit.